My name is Denise. I'm a librarian on campus and I teach in the LIBT program. And this is the second in our series of book clubs that we started doing since the COVID. Uh, we typically have um, events on campus in the libraries, poetry readings, our book of the year pr uh, program that goes for a couple months of the year, sometimes guest authors, whatever. Obviously we can't do those now, so we're trying this kind of different modality. Um, we had our first book club in the spring and that was um, Little Fires Everywhere, sorry, in the summer, Little Fires Everywhere, and that people liked it. We had about 15 people attend, and we had a little contest to name, um, and there's Ellen, I, to name the book club, and they came up with Words of Change. So uh, just a little plug, we will have a couple more coming up this fall. Our next one is in October, October 15th. And it's Brown Girl Dreaming by um, a multiple award winner, Jacqueline Woodson. And then in November, on November 19th, we have um, a graphic novel, although it's not actually a novel, it's a biography or autobiography. Um, March Book One by Senator John Lewis and Andrew Iden. So uh, these are on our website and I'll post that um, to the chat. Um, in the meantime, let's introduce, we have a couple of our staff here. Uh, Lori is going to be our facilitator for today, but we also have Sharon and Susan. You guys want to introduce yourself? Or you sure. Want I'm Lori Buckles. I'm a librarian normally at the North County campus at Cuesta. And i um, glad to be here. I have a few questions that I devised for us to talk about, um, but also we'll kind of try to just let the conversation flow. So we'll try to find a balance of, of structure and just free conversation. And who wants to introduce themselves next? I'll, I'll go ahead. I'm Sharon. I'm a librarian in SLO normally, and um, I'm a facilitator with this, and I'll be hosting the March Book One Book Club Choice discussion. So thanks. Thanks for being here. I'm Susan. I'm a library clerk at the SLO campus. And um, just really glad to be here, love to read, love to talk about books. Okay, thanks. And so our staff people are gonna be watching the chat if you have questions or something comes up, we'll be watching that while Lori will be uh, leading us. Okay, shall we go around the room and just um, in quickly introduce yourself, the other folks that are here? And we'll start with Ellen. Hi, I'm Ellen. Um, I'm new to slow, only four years now, and I enjoy reading. I did not read this book, but I'm very, very interested in it. Um, Susan has inter interested me in this group, and she said this was quite an interesting one. So thank you. Okay, thanks for joining us. Sue, how about you? I'm a part-time instructor at, um, I've taught at both campuses, now online, of course. Um, I teach computer applications and some business courses. And I also love to read. Okay. And talk about books. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Okay, let's see. How about Matt? Uh, yeah, Matt Martini. I'm up in the Bay Area. I'm an LIBT student going on, uh, I think this is my fourth semester now. Getting close to the end here. I still have uh, a few classes to go. And uh, I do love to read. I hated reading all the way through college until after. <laughs> and it became a passion after. I don't know how that works. But uh, yeah, it was uh, nothing, I, nothing I enjoyed all the way through college. I graduated in uh, 97 from SF State. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. And I know. And as far as the book, I, I did not get a chance to read it. I did go over the uh, teacher's guide, though, and I read that. So I'm okay. familiar yeah. with some of the content. That's cool. We're not going to penalize you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ashley. Hello. I'm also an um, LABT student. I'm almost done with the program. Um, I have read the book, but it's been so long. I pulled out my copy thinking, oh, I have time to brush it up this morning, but uh, no. Two-year-olds have their own plans, as you know. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad you could join us. Thank you. Carissa. I am Carissa, and I'm in my, I think my last semester of LIBT, except for the internship, which is, I really want to do in a school, so that's going to be kind of a, not sure how that's going to work out, um, and I used to be a social worker, so that I kind of am making a career shift from that, and lived 
in the Seattle area for 20 years, but I grew up here on the Central Coast and now live in Los Osos, um, back here on the coast. Okay. I've got my parents are here, you know, it always draws you back. <laughs> Very good. Okay. I think with that, we can take it away, Lori. If we have people that come late, we'll just, you know, no biggie. Sounds good. So before we started, I just wanted to bring up a topic of conversation um, about the N-word. So this book, as you probably noticed, was written in 1861, and it, it uses the language of the time, um, including words that we now don't consider like socially appropriate or even respectful. So I just wanted to bring to your attention the words in the book. Generally, I would say uh, people shouldn't use the word but I'll leave that up to your discretion depending on um, your, your instincts and feelings. So with that, let's launch into, like I said, I, I, I made up a bunch of questions and we can use them or not use them, but let me just throw one out to the group and we can start with it. So what I thought might be a good starting point is what struck you the most while reading this book and or what are you most likely to remember about it? I know I, I was really struck by, I, I think a lot of times about the audience that a book is written for and the role in the, um, really the audience wasn't just Northerners or white Northerners, but white women in the North. And the idea that if they could be an outraged enough about the intention of purity on her part that she couldn't achieve in, in slave, situations that that would be um, one of the drivers of ending slavery and it wasn't I guess it wasn't something I had thought about a lot as um, like a piece of log on the fire of abolition um, and it that was a really that was really interesting to me in in general um, and also the fact that she had to make all these excuses for why she made all these choices. And I know this is like Victorian, you know, era, and it's easy to look back on it through our own lens, but um, just the, like the pretzel she had to shape herself into in order to make white um, Northern women feel like she was respectable. Like right in the very beginning, it even says in the introduction that she's um, can be believed because she's lived for so many years with an esteemed family. And they never even say it's a white family. It's just an assumption that, that this family vouches for the kind of character that she has. And I, I don't know, that really, that really struck me. And I'll, I don't know, it was an incredible narrative in general. You bring up a lot of very interesting themes from the book. Uh, let's see, uh, does anyone want to jump off from, from what Carissa said? I was, uh, I noticed that um, after reading the book for a while, I got that she was of mixed race. She wasn't just totally black or African American. And that uh, her grandmother to her mother, they had a higher standing in the community and amongst the slaves, I think because of the background, because some of the um, white ancestors were, you know, slave owners and so on. And that gave them a certain amount of power and privilege. Now, even with that, they still had a horrible time dealing with the predation of, you know, the women in particular and that they could be sold at any time their children could be sold off, of course, but the fact that she was able to learn to read and write and that um, she was able to have a little bit easier time as a slave compared, and she makes this distinction too. You know, she, a few times she's in these situations and she says, I would rather be working on a plantation than have to deal with this master coming after me and trying to, you know, be a predator on her, you know, and so I, I think that uh, it, it's an in interesting kind of juxtaposition 
that she's in that she has some privilege for a slave and is able to then write this narrative later on having learned to read and write at the same time she's still under this horrible situation where you know she's not doesn't even have control of her body and has to make these horrible choices so. I agree. You also bring up themes that I was hoping would come up in our conversation. So let's let's keep going. Anybody want to jump off of anything? Yeah, Ellen. Um, let me tell you, in my background, first of all, I'm 81 years old. Second of all, I was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, where I lived for 45 years. Uh, next, if you can see this, this is my father. Can you see who's mm. taking care of him? My father was born in 1906. This was my childhood. That was my best friend, Annie. Annie took care of me and our family. I have a lot of background in Nashville, in the South, in the deep, the words that I, I know were in the book are totally unfamiliar, totally familiar to me. I grew up amongst it. I was thrown off a bus for sitting with my friends who happened to be the black people who worked with me. You can't sit there. Why? It's for the N word. It's for them. You have to get off, but they're my friends. I won't go farther. I'm very anxious to read the book. I hope to be able to borrow a copy from someone. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. And those pictures are, they lend such a nuance to this conversation. Susan. I think what has been most striking to me is something very simple, but this is like a little book, but um, it's written in, in a conversational Home, like the style she's using. I feel like she's like sitting there talking to me. And I think what I am going to take away from this is that without really trying hard, just telling what was going on, she really communicated to me how it feels to be a mother knowing that your child, your baby, your, ch your children can be sold and taken away from you at any moment. How horrifyingly awful that feels, how much fear and just having the thoughts like I'd rather that my child be dead than and I be dead than for this to happen. I I've read it before, but I've never felt it viscer viscerally so much before as in this book. And the amazing thing to me also is like, after going through college and reading so much all my life, I'd never heard of this book before. Mm -hmm. I never mm -hmm. heard of her before. And it just seems like it should have been part of my education somewhere along the way. Mm -hmm or somewhere, but I never, I never would even have read this if it wasn't for this book group. So thanks for choosing it. That's true of me too. And I have a master's degree in English. I'm just yeah. wondering if anybody had heard of this book before. Yeah, it's, it's requested by students in different history classes or um, multicultural literature classes or even women's studies. So it, yeah, I've heard of it. I hadn't, I'd only read the YA novel version of it a couple years ago, and that was when I was on vacation in Virginia, and we were at different historic sites, and it was prominently displayed as well as the actual, um, this narrative as well. I have to say too, like, um, and Susan, I have to, do we have another Susan, or is it just, okay, I thought maybe there were two Susans and a Sue, but anyway, <laughs> Um, I agree with you. That's something I, it was heart wrenching to me. And that's a part of slavery that I just didn't dig deep in and really think about that. 
what that would have been like. And she mentioned, I mean, how just, it was, I, I can't even imagine that. And I also want to share and say, unlike Ellen, um, I grew up in the Midwest in Wisconsin. And I, I lived in a very white, um, there were a lot of German Im immigrants, but I, until I went to college, I did not see any diversity whatsoever. And so I, and I don't even remember in school, it's like we would hear about slavery, but you just, it was just taught in the sense that they were people that, you know, had to work for other people, but you didn't know the really deep, dark, awful history of it. The same way we didn't know about the, we weren't really taught about the Native Americans. The Native Americans, when we would play cowboys and Indians, the, the, the Native Americans, the Indians were the bad guys and the cowboys were the good guys. You know, that I lived in a very whitewashed area and I'm so thankful that I didn't, that I'm open, I, I, that I, that I can read something like this and be horrified and disgusted that one, that people can treat other people like that and regard other people like that just because of the color of their skin. I, I still don't understand it to this day and it's going on right now too. And even in our country, we've had children ripped away, separated from their parents that are seeking asylum. And so it's still, it's like, when is this, when is this gonna end that people are treated differently because of where they come from or the color of their skin. I just, I don't understand it. So I like to, you know, I think we tend to, if it doesn't directly affect us, we tend to forget, not forget, but we just don't think about it. We just don't think about it. And we should, and we should be ashamed and we should be moved to then do something about it. Well said. Ellen? Well, very quickly, let me tell you, yes, I did grow up in the South. That's my father was 1906 born and my mother in 1908. However, even though I was only born in 1939, I was really privileged. Um, I still count among my close friends an architect in Phoenix where I lived for, uh, for 34 years. Um, I was privileged to be um, very, very well exposed and friends with people at Fisk University in Nashville. Uh, my father not only taught, but took me with him to visit patients at Meharry Hospital, which was a teaching hospital started by, um, I believe, a Baptist, a white Baptist group back just after the Civil War. So there are a lot of good things. I, I'm loaded with good things, along with being thrown off a bus for sitting in the back when I'm not supposed to, and knowing too well of black people who were strange fruit, and that you need to look up the title and understand why it was what it was, what it said, who wrote it, who sang it. Um, I still am absolutely devastated with what's going on. The fact that we're not all individuals we weren't taught in schools. It was all, excuse me, all blacked out. So much truth has been abolished, abandoned, denied, whether it's race, religion, sex, gender, whatever. But it's important to be exposed to it. That's why it's important that I read this book too, among others. Yeah, I think, oh, go ahead, Denise. I was just gonna say, 
I was really impressed throughout the book with her resilience. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, and I shared this with Lori and Susan the other day too. I mean, here right now we're in the COVID thing. We're um, feeling tedious and locked in and worried and, and sequestered. And then here, this woman is in set for seven years. She's in this mm -hmm. little like coffin like existence in this, you know, crawl space and existing that way. And, you know, I, I feel kind of ashamed at the level that I've complained about our existence now in comparison to that. And not only that, she, she meets each of her many challenges with that same um, resilience and, um, you know, ability to keep trying over and over. I mean, that to me is amazing. So... I just put a link in the chat to the book Strange Fruit that Ellen just mentioned. It's just a Wikipedia blurb about the book, but something that you could maybe look up more about later if you're interested. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, I, maybe let's let's go off of resilience. And what do we what do you attribute her resilience to? What do you think kept her going and kept her sane and sound through those seven years? I think it was, uh, she was, you know, she had that grandmother. I mean, she had her parents around her, but in particular, the grandmother was sort of the matriarch. And her, the opinion of the grandmother and her standing in the community and her guidance really shaped her life. Or at least that's the way it seemed to me from the book. And she always held herself, seemed to hold herself to that standard. And she saw her grandmother have to mitigate circumstances and persevere through that racial divide and hold herself high. And I think she was trying, uh, attempting to do the same thing as best she could. So, and I think, and, and, and the, the thought of eventually having freedom, you know, so that was really important to her and kept her going. So. Yeah, I think the ability to read and write maybe kept her sane as well. And I don't know if we want to talk more about education and why it was illegal to teach slaves mm. to read and write and maybe talk now about education. That might be reaching, but do you have thoughts about the fact that she was educated and how that affected her life? trajectory? I, well, I'll, I'll go ahead. I, I'm going twice in a row, but, you know, for a while there, you know, when Nat Turner had his um, upright, the upright, so they were doing those raids and they were looking for anything written by, by slaves because this was a way of, uh, you know, uh, knowledge is power, and uh, this was a way of communicating. So the, the slaves that had the ability to read and write and could communicate and pass notes and words, plus there were many, many white Southerners who were illiterate. And that was a contention uh, culturally that how could these, you know, African American, these slaves, have more knowledge than we do. They're supposed to be less than we are. And so there was a, you know, a, a, just in the raids that they were doing around that time when the militias came in and were, you know, trying to really exert their power and they were looking for anything written and, and, and if they had uh, material goods that were greater than what uh, these folks had at home, there was surprise and shock and anger, and then they often, you know, pilfered from that too. So there is the um, the planter class, you know, could could afford to have uh, slaves and people doing the work for them, but there was a large underclass, you know, often referred to as crackers or the white, you know, working folks who were 
on the edge, just above slavery, and they were some of the the hardest on slaves and um, you know escaped slaves and so on. So I think education for slaves was something they had to keep hidden as best they could because it was power. Carissa. Um, I, I think the education part is sort of both a lock, um, not a lock, a key and a tool. Like it was a key to, for her to understand um, what might be more possible in life um, as opposed to having that narrow view um, and also clearly a tool to express herself. But the thing that really struck me around the resilience is what I know from having worked with children. Um, I was a school social worker and the resilience and developmental stage for her to go through to the age of six to not even be aware of her situation. Um, there's a, a, a way in which especially young girls are developmentally get a sense of themselves between six to eight is sort of that that window when it starts to close. And then to not really be in a situation where she was truly in um, extreme danger um, until 12 adolescence is also this shifting space where um, like I keep thinking of like that the term like often the idea of an uppity black like the, uh, the, that they are they're taking more space than they're allowed um, same thing with women you know you get called the b-word if you're you're being um, forceful and I think that those things were really solidified in some ways not just by education but by developmental milestones that were reinforced for her that were really unique. She had a very unique life and, um, and I'm really grateful that she did because she was able to, to provide this both at then and for us to read now. Really interesting insights. Yeah, Susan. Oh, you're on mute. Did you wanna speak first? Cause I can wait. No, no, no. Um, I guess this book brought up for me that psychologically, I think there's a connection between reading and the desire to be free. I'd never really thought about that before, but in her case, it had to do with slavery and being considered less than human, but somehow being able to read, I think, kept the desire to be free alive and I think that's true for uh, people who either adult or children or who are in abusive situations or who are in inequitable situations whatever situation they're in where they're not feeling free to be themselves fully or achieve their potential fully there's something about being able to read and either by intention or accident reading about somebody else that has a life or is achieving some sort of dream that you may have never told anybody that that's what you want there's something about that that is just so human and so essential that I just never thought about the connection before. So this book has really been a gift in many ways. Thank you. That reminds me of in the autobiography of Malcolm X when he is in prison and he decides he's gonna copy the dictionary page by page by page. And it, it's inspired by his realization that literacy is freedom. Uh, so that's, that's really cool that you brought that up. Well, and one follow up to that, sorry, this is quick, is that it just occurred to me, like, I heard the poet Jimmy Santiago Baca speak once. I don't know if you're all familiar with him, but he was in prison as a young man and couldn't read, but just out of spite, like, stole a book from the prison library. He couldn't even read it, but he taught himself how to read and it changed his entire life. He became a poet. He got out of prison. He's been a teacher and it's amazing like what happened to him uh, when he taught himself how to read and how 
how that just opened up another life. So I just wanted to add that to what you said, Lori. Thank you. Yeah, I've been working in a uh, juvenile halls and a jail for over 20 years. Those guys are voracious readers. You'd be shocked at what they read, including the classics. I did find uh, during a search once a list of uh, by it was a high ranking gang member of titles they read from personal power to Dale Carnegie's uh, how to make friends and influence people. It was interesting to see that. So there's uh, not everything they read is positive, but there is stuff in there. And that was that list in particular was not something that was leading to a positive end it had to do with, you know, <laughs> crime in general, but, uh, and they're also well up, on, they're up on uh, current events. Like you'd be, you'd be very surprised. You could have a lot of uh, good conversations with those guys I have over the years. So. Very interesting. Ellen, I think I saw it, yeah. Uh, you know, they may not have been able or allowed to learn to read, but how did they get out? How did the people, the slaves, the enslaved, the lesser than people know how to navigate? They couldn't write, they couldn't draw maps. The spirituals, the gospels, the songs, we know were there maps where to go when to go what to look in the const look for in the constellations how to avoid i can't imagine trying to go through a swamp full of alligators or be down where the enslaved were mostly kept in the malaria and the mosquito borne rice lands cane fields in in the South. I've seen it. I've been there. I know. But the fact that that was their language, it wasn't written, it was sung, it was spoken, and it was seen in the stars and passed along. We have a lot to be grateful for what we did not allow them to know. Denise, did you want to? Yeah, I recently saw um, a somewhat recent film version of, you know, biopic of Harriet Tubman and all that she did, she was illiterate. And that was part of the depiction that she, you know, her ability to keep bringing people north on the um, Underground Railway was by use of songs, constellations, landmarks, you know, a certain, you know, tree in the fork, I mean, which is just amazing but yet so un unfair uh, on a whole nother level. Well, I, I am interested in a particular question, so I'm just going to kind of abruptly uh, segue and see what you guys think of it. Uh, I have to confess that I thought during the time period that a master would just rape. A, a woman that he wanted to have sex with. I, I was very surprised by the nuances of the Dr. Flint and Linda quote unquote relationship. And so I'm just curious what you thought, like why was he so obsessed with her? What, what, was, what was the nature of what he thought was happening between them? But what, do you, what do you make of that? I think he felt his privilege and his being the master that she, she would be grateful to be his mistress somehow. I think her having the grandmother she did who was in the community and, and knew from what she had written uh, in the book, uh, neighbors and people and planters, they all knew each other and they knew what was going on. And she let it get out there that, um, you know, this guy, he's after me. And, and I think her, you know, when she finally felt like she could confess to her grandmother that her grandmother talked to the guy and she had enough gravitas to be able to do that. I think she, if she didn't have a grandmother, she would have been a lot more vulnerable, a lot, I mean, she would have, it would have ended differently. I think there was a lot of rape and no choice in mm -hmm. slavery South. I'm sure there was. I think 
this guy probably felt like he was more refined and because he was dealing with a an african-american slave of mixed race maybe he owed some sort of a little bit of deference or something i'm not sure hard to know for sure he also was a practicing physician probably like the only one around so i mean that maybe he although that works two ways there's nobody else around but he felt he had to live up to some standard and not completely denigrate no no pun intended his uh business brand but yeah he was obsessed clearly you know um talking again about resilience i think or um harriet that she was able to be so re resilient because she was determined to save her children because she was afraid if she she probably could have escaped and gone north but she couldn't leave her children but she was also re her her fierce um re, uh desire to not give in to mr flint and not to let him do whatever he wanted to do with her was she was determined that she wasn't going to bend to that and she was going to do whatever she needed to do in order for that not to happen and you know and plus the love of her children because she was worried how he might retaliate against her through her children um that was what I mean, to the point of, as we mentioned before, staying in this small, small area for seven years um, uh, makes what we're going through right now, we still have so much freedom, but she hardly had any freedom. And then she was continuously worrying, not so much about herself, though she was suffering physically and mentally, but she was worrying about the people outside. Mm -hmm. I read someplace, but I can't remember where, so maybe one of you read it too and will remember, but I thought that Dr. Flint, perhaps not raping her, like I, I still am not quite sure, but that I read someplace it had to do with the other man because she decided to have a relationship with the, I uh, can't remember what his name is, either fictionally or in reality, but she just the father of her children she decided to have a relationship with him because he was actually a higher social status or had more power politically he became a didn't he become a congressman or yes. something mm -hmm. so he had more it was a guy thing maybe like more power and so that prevented him dr flint from raping her perhaps because the other man could have hurt him in some way i don't know did anybody read that somewhere yeah. else yes yeah. I, I saw that in the bio like that the actual mr sands in real life was a lawyer and then mm -hmm. of a, a higher status than the doctor so mm -hmm. she was hoping she was sort of under his protection was somebody else chiming in on that? Yeah, I, I th it, it mentioned it in the story too, because at first she had fallen in love with a black man mm -hmm. and her mask, Dr. Flint told her, if you pursue that, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he for, forbid her, because I think he threatened her with something again. And, and so then she thought that she would get together with this white, white man who and have children with him because she thought that would safeguard put safeguarders so to speak against her um, from her m master don't you think that there's a certain amount of 
power there. I mean, you know, her master has all this power over her. And she really would, of course, love to have had her own choice in life. And so she made this choice. And in hoping that the, the, the father of her children, the lover, could, you know, protect her. But I think she was tired of being so pressured and, and feeling like she, you know, was backed into a corner. And by then she, she felt like, you know, I, I can't stand you, you know, to the master. I'm going to actually, this is the lesser of two evils of the way to go. Mm -hmm. And I'm grabbing a certain amount of power because this is my choice. That's the way I kind of saw it. I'm seeing what time it is and wondering, are there themes in the book that, that struck you that we haven't talked about at all? Like, are you sitting there thinking, man, you guys are totally missing something? Give you a second to think about that. If not, I'll, I'll throw out another one of my questions. I'm debating between questions that seem too broad and deep and ones that we seem to have touched on in some ways already. Um, how about this as a feminist work? Oh, sorry, Denise. It's just, just a quick little thing that I just thought about. I, in reading towards the end this morning, I was surprised how many people she kept coming, uh, running up, uh, running into in New York uh, and Boston, uh, sl former slaves that were in from her hometown or her community. And I just had a, a confusing sense of how many successful runaways there were um, at that time. But she mentioned maybe a dozen times, oh, I saw so-and-so from my old community and I got spread the word to them or whatever. So I, I don't know if that struck anyone mm -hmm. else. but And I certainly don't know enough about numbers and statistics uh, on that. That did strike me. And I meant to do a little research, like how big was Brooklyn at population-wise at the time, and how likely was this? But I really don't know. Do we feel like she took some um, literary liberties with her story? Mm -hmm. If so, do you approve of her literary choices, or were there some that you would take issue with? Presuming that we can make those calls. Well, it, it seemed like she had advice on how to get this published. And so perhaps, you know, it, it was in my mind, like, what is fiction? What is memoir here? Mm -hmm. And what is true and what is fictionalized in order to get published? Because she was trying to write in the style of a romance novel. It, or was it a romance novel or some sort of literary genre at the time to get published? So I kind of let go of, of any sort of blurring of those lines, figuring that most of it was true, like 99% true. And she had to do something late to get published, so. Ellen. I'd like to ask a question of Matt. Would a book like this, in your, in your line of work, mm -hmm. working with incarcerated, primarily men, I'm assuming, would, would this book be allowed to be distributed, read, or discussed? Uh, yeah, the, the way it works, there's, you know, other than something that's like pornographic or, uh, that's the main thing we'll keep out of there. Everything else is fair game. Uh, their families can send them stuff from Amazon. We do have a library in the, in the uh, basement. It's uh, not a traditional library. It's donated books. They cluster them according to authors or subjects. So 
it's, it's loosely cataloged that way, but uh, it runs a gamut of stuff they can read. And then they can request down there that whatever their family send them. Something like this, I've seen uh, a lot, a lot of stuff in the jail over, that you might consider more radical stuff. I'm not saying this is radical. I'm just saying, yeah, this book would be no problem in the jail at all. If... It wouldn't be anticipated that violence could erupt from the black-white issues that are so explosive today. That's that's really why I was wondering. Uh, I, from my experience, uh, you know, I, I work a facility where I'm literally in the room with everybody. We're not behind bars or walls or I'm literally walking around with people. So uh, hence there's a lot of interaction that goes on there. People are kind of surprised when they see those types of setups. They're actually pretty effective in preventing problems. But yeah, I, I don't see something like this causing an issue. It would be something that, you know, realistically, Anybody in, in a housing unit could read, regardless of race. You know, they're so bored looking for stuff to do. I'm sure they'd read it. A few guys probably wouldn't like it. In general, it would be probably entertaining to those willing to read it. So, it could make for very good discussions. It could, yeah, it could. It's, uh, it's, uh, like I said, I've had a lot of good talks with those guys over the years, and you'd be surprised. I consider them, in many cases, far more informed on current events because they're newspapers watching the news. I mean time to talk it's uh, you'd be surprised you know i'm not saying there's a high level of education there but uh from my experience uh, it's it's been pretty interesting <laughs> the stuff i've learned and and heard in, the, in that line of work which is uh it's it's coming to a close here in a few more years i'm almost done but uh yeah it's been it's been an experience from that aspect but no this book would be fine in in that environment for sure yeah. thank you mm -hmm. Well, let me throw out a question about morality and religion, because I think she kind of tries to make, mm. well, the case for her own morality throughout the book, but then her conflicting feelings about religion and ways in which it can be hypocritical and ways, ways in which it can be genuine. So do you have any thoughts about morality and religion and the tension between them? I think she touches on that um, in the book to a certain degree. And I think she noted that there were two standards. There was the white standard of religion and so on. And then there were the slaves, which I think to a certain degree, they expected to have you know, those moral standards. But then in their interaction with the slaves, somehow that didn't apply or there were the lines were blurred or however you want to see it and so of course you know just like the dr clint you know pressing him you know, being married and pressing himself on the slave and trying pressuring her you know to uh, have sex with him and she saw it as morally wrong but somehow he saw it as okay because she was his property but it really, that was an excuse for hypocrisy. So I think she, she saw that and saw the difference. And so. Other thoughts on morality in the book? Who's the most moral character? Who's the least? What does morality actually mean? in the context of slavery? I don't have a, a, a specific answer to that, but one of the quotes that I really, in the very beginning, that really struck me is, um, she quotes, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then she says, but I was her slave, and I suppose she did not recognize me as her neighbor. And so I thought from a religious perspective like that, it was sort of this idea that, you know, purity or morality, like it didn't apply to slaves because they weren't of the same fabric, um, you know, literally not human in many ways. So it was just sort of like there was this tension that she was making a lot of assumptions um, 
about her own ability to be a moral person that would make it sympathetic. And for people who were reading it, like the audience wasn't other black women in slavery, to feel that, that connection, that thread between you and this, this other human woman experiencing this and what would it be like to be in her shoes? And I think that that moral uh, tension, I, I just felt through the whole book. Yeah, she was really, it was very difficult for her to come to terms with the decision that she had made to have two children by a, a man. And I don't think she ever really came to terms with that. But that's the de decision she felt she had to make given her circumstances. And even in that scene where she was going to tell her daughter finally and and she was, and then finally the girl just says, mom, I know all about it. And didn't seem, it didn't seem to bother her. So I think that was, it was almost like this, a time when she could just take a breath and breathe for the first time. Cause she felt she tortured herself more about that than almost anything. Um, and it, it, I, I, I just can't imagine living where and she mentioned that a lot of times that, you know, these decisions that we make, we make them because of our circumstances. And if they, meaning white people or non-slaves, if they could only understand what it felt to be in that position, then they would feel they would feel, she hoped that they would feel differently too, but she couldn't stop punishing herself for that. Alan? The more I listen, the more anxious I am to read this book mm -hmm. because the word slave has been used to, to um, express a black person who came in a ship having been sold by their own countrymen much of the times. Whereas the white woman, the white wife, the mm -hmm. a wife was nothing less than enslaved. Those are two words, slave and enslaved. How would a wife feel? She was enslaved, she was a possession, she, didn't want to have children. The only way was for her husband to have relations with his slaves. She had no choice. She would lose everything. But that's why I'm even more anxious to read this book, to hear how everyone views it, thinks of it, and what was thought then. Yes, the author makes them very to me, startling claims about what slavery did to the morality of everyone, including the wives and the daughters of the slaveholders. Um, she's making the argument that slavery was the enemy of morality, like for everyone. It goes back in history, back in the Bible and the Torah. <laughs> Well, Denise, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Unmute. Um, I think I was impressed by her continual depiction of Mrs. Flint, who was mm. pretty cruel. Uh, this is Dr. Flint, the master's wife, so the <clears throat> mistress. And um, as Ellen was saying, um, and Lori too, she makes the point that the wives and daughters of the slave masters, slave holders, slave owners were also quite um, affected because they would enter into a marriage thinking that, oh, I've, you know, this great plantation and we have all these slaves and I have this new husband and I have all this fine china and, you know, linens. And then perhaps not getting it that part of the, the man's domain was to sleep with any of the slaves, have more, uh, um, mixed race children who were a valued economic product, not really 
a human being so much. And then the love of the wife for the slave master was really, you know, spoiled, tainted. And then to, to look at your daughter and say, well, she's going to marry the other guy down the road and same thing's going to happen to her. So there's a lot of emphasis on that piece, uh, which I wasn't really thinking about that so much. I think that's a good point. And I remember reading, this was Dr. Flynn's second wife, and she was 16 when uh, he married her. And so she, you know, was not the most mature individual, and he was old enough to be her father. So you can only imagine she comes into that situation and then finds out he's pursuing, you know, slaves, what might ensue. And you could, to be the, you know, the author and be caught between the master and the master's wife, what a horrible place to be. No wonder she felt like she wished she was dead sometimes. I mean, you know, what an awful place to be. And her sense of morality, again, I think came from her grandmother. And she was always trying to hold herself to that high standard. And supposedly the wives and the, you know, genteel Southerners were doing the same thing when we know it wasn't so much, it, you know, in, as a front, you know, and out in the community, but behind the doors is another story situation. Is there anything else about the book that you've been hoping we would talk about? Characters you liked or disliked, turns of events that you found surprising, or just like overall takeaways from the book? <laughs> Oops. Not hearing any. Denise, can I turn it back over to you? Tina, were you trying to say something there? No, I was trying to mute because my dog started barking. <laughs> I'm having <laughs> animal problems today. So well, at least he's not barfing. <laughs> I thought that's what you said. No, that's my cat that does that. Okay, well. <laughs> um. Yeah, the last time we did this gr book group, we had it for an hour and people said we needed more uh, free flowing um, time. So we extended it. So I think I would just follow up with Lori's comment. This is a good time to kind of pull in anything we didn't talk about. Um, I know I didn't like the, the part where she was hiding in the dismal swamp or the snaggy mm. swamp and got bit by a poisonous snake. Oh, that got me going. And that was like one of the least of her, you know, worries. Um, but yeah, feel free to pipe up. And even if you haven't read the book, it's fine. If you want to say something, that's cool. But let's just take a minute to kind of just free flow. Uh, I'll say just having read the, uh, hold on, what's it called here? The uh, teacher's guide uh, and just going through that, it was to me kind of like a cliff note, but it definitely adds a uh, personal, a personal perspective on this history of that period where I know Sue was talking about earlier let's say we learn the history of slavery in school and it's, uh, it's impersonal. You, it's just a system. You don't really know that people were involved in it and their experiences, you know, which as we can see, the dynamics are actually pretty, uh, from what I'm gathering, because like I said, I haven't read it, is, it's pretty complicated for, you know, both slave, non-slave, mixed race, and all these other dynamics that get worked into this. But uh, like I said, it's, it's an inter it would be an interesting uh, first person perspective, you know, that's a, uh, that's what I got from the thing I was able to read prior to this. So. Well, and we do try to make these um, lib guides or reading guides to go with the discussion so that say you didn't have a chance to read it or maybe you read it and forgot it or you wanna go and do it later. And actually some um, of the instructors on our campus use these in class um, when they are reading a, a certain book um, required reading. So yeah, if you have ideas for that kind of thing, let us know. You know, one of the things in listening to the conversation and having started the book but not finished it, what struck me about her was her voice and how strong and resilient that voice was throughout the book and how she never gave up. I mean, there was sounds like I haven't 
finished it, that, that there were so many instances when she could have given up. Mm. She didn't. And she just, she had that. And I attribute that from what many things Julie has said, that her grandmother was such a, a force in her life that she just didn't want to disappoint her grandmother, even though her grandmother may not have been there, but her grand, she didn't want to disappoint her and what her grandmother had done for her and given up for her and allowed her to have that foundation and become who she is. And so I, I, her voice to me just sounds so resilient and hopeful in spite of everything that happened. And so that's, that's something that I have gleaned from the conversation and stuff. I think Carissa's point too about early childhood development and the fact that she had those first 12 years a relative like comfort and support made a huge difference in her life trajectory. I also appreciated when she would when she would mention and she did this numerous times throughout the book the kindness and compassion that was extended to her by white people that she met along the way that helped her, like Mrs. Bruce or the um, captain on one of the ships that she was on. And it, you could almost feel the gratitude that she had because of the kindness that that family or those people extended to her and here they were strangers but they were willing probably i would imagine back then they they would would have been in deep deep trouble if they would have if it was known what they had done and um so anyway i i thought that that she had she could have had a lot of reasons to be very bitter but yet when she still did not fail to recognize and give credit to those that helped her along the way. And she was forever grateful for that. And that's something I think we all need to keep in mind in our own lives, so. I also think that uh, she knew that it could have been a lot worse that uh, the other slaves that were working on the plantations that whose lives were shortened just with the, the brutal conditions that they lived in. And there's always that threat of being sold south and being you know, put in a, a more difficult situation. And she knew that even though she had it difficult you know, in her own life, just trying, trying to get free, trying to keep her children if possible, that kind of thing, that other people had it even worse. Yeah, other slaves had it even worse. And so and she does make that point, I think, a few times in the book. Um, the punishments and uh, the way that they were treated. I still, I still wonder, what was the purpose of a southern gentleman uh, having a wife? if she didn't know how to run a household, if she got obnoxious, she was simply plied with laudanum. She was made into a vegetable. A slave, on the other hand, was abused, punished, um, sent south. There was, she was an, animate object that could be punished, whereas a wife could not. Wow, what a position. I'm, I think, I mean, I think that a wife could be punished. Um, I think the wife is there to have sire your children, to have your, your next of kin and then a spare. And then for social engagements, <laughs> for hospitality. <laughs> That's about all it was with social engagement because with death, with childbirth, loss of children, multiple pregnancies, unwanted, uh, there's a lot to think about. 
Thank you. Well, I had one last pretty broad question. We'll see, we'll see what you make of it. So how do themes in the book connect to current social issues in the United States? And what can we learn from Jacob's experience? If she were alive now, what would she have us do? Um, dismantle our caste system, potentially. I don't know. <laughs> I'm glad that you brought up the caste system because mm -hmm. that we didn't really talk about that. You want to talk a little bit more about what you mean by caste system? Um, I I haven't read the book yet, uh, <laughs> but uh, Lori and Denise, you probably know the author of the recent book where she uh, sort of illustrates and breaks down the caste system of race within the United States and, and the history, she uncovered the whole history of it and how it was used as a model for the, for the Nazis in Germany, um, including like, you know, them traveling here to see it in action with with our country and then us traveling there to teach them how to you know use our system of racism to develop their own caste system and and uh, it's something that we don't really see and so you know right now we tend to like oh you know like i can see that horrible statue i can you know this this college has this name, you know, those are things we can easily see and identify. Um, I'll take down this flag, but that now we're looking at, okay, and this is where the world work it needs to be done is all the things that we can't see, like the flowers on the chains of, of the system that is upholding racism in our country. And so, I, it's the first step for us to to be able to see that system and then we can dismantle it the same that we are way we are you know the statues and the flags and the, the things like that one thing that was i was struck by and confused by too is the legal quote unquote status of many of the people in the book there are the bound servants uh there are the free blacks there are those that who have been sold from one master to the other and then have kind of dodgy legal um, status over who owns them, who can resell them, who can buy them. Um, those that have escaped but have, have not had their freedom bought or are not legally free. Like for example, the grandmother was a free black woman and I can't remember mm. how that came about, but that certainly is a part of the structure of the caste system, just a, a beginning at least. Yeah, it was I, fascinating because the grandmother made her own money and even loaned money mm -hmm. to the slave owner. Like, weird. And Ellen, I saw your hand. I was, I've been perplexed for a long time. What is the use of the word African American. How long are we going to use that to explain a person who is born in this country, who is an American, or who has been naturalized? Why do we continue to say African American? Is it just me? Am I missing something? That's caste system. Why do we keep saying African American. The Jewish expression, the Yiddish word is schwarze. That was in my generation, the Yiddish word. It means black, dark. It worked for us. The N word I find offensive. I always did. But why do we continue to say African American, though you're three generations? born in this country. Help me someone. <laughs> Elizabeth. 
I, I, from what I, from what I am listening to, um, the trend is you're right, moving away from the term African American because a lot of people don't actually fit within that term. You know, like they come from, you know, different parts of the world that are not Africa, and yet they are identified and self-identify as black. And so, I think that the two terms that I hear being used now are like the one that that you were saying, uh, like Schwarza, which is my name actually. <laughs> and, uh, and well, at like black and then uh, also, you know, people of color. And uh, also speaking to people's like nationalities, if we, if we know it, you know, um, if that's applicable, if we're speaking about a specific region. I was fortunate to have an African-American man who was one of my professors um, in the School of Education in Wisconsin, and we had this conversation. And I, I personally just try to defer to what a person prefers to be called. And he said, African American conveys a level of respect that I don't feel from the word black, for example. Uh, but that could have been just his perspective. And he told us as students, we were welcome to use black, people of color, African American sort of interchangeably. Yeah, I agree, Lori. Like, I think, yeah, the, the, you're right. The first one should be their preferred identif identifier. And then if we're speaking about a, a group of people or um, someone we don't know, then potentially, you know, Black or people of color, I don't know. I'm sure things will change. Things will always be changing. <laughs> Well, we're down to about 10 more minutes. Any burning insights you, you'd like to, to share? Final thought? I put a link in the, again, in the chat to the New York Times Magazine article by Isabel Wilkerson on the caste um, system in, uh, in America. So that's a link in there for you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, speaking of caste, I couldn't help but feel, and that was mentioned several times in the book, how the the fate of the children was um, defined by the position of the mother, not the father. And I, I, I would have to study on that. Does anyone know why? Why would it? Um, I think it was economics because the child would stay longer with the mother and that meant they were probably bound to the plantation and then they could be resold or they could be, be sold as a twosome. Uh, I think, I think it was just money, but I could be wrong. Could be also that it was so shameful to have a white woman have a child by a, a black man. So you, you just didn't even want to acknowledge it. You know, get that, get that child out of there any way you can. Also, there was, you know, just as, as uh, many of the wives uh, of, of planters who knew what was going on and saw these, you know, half white, half black children and knew where they came from it was like they, if they had enough, they're angry enough, they put their foot down and said, they're out of here. And the, you know, he wanted peace in his house, the, the man complied. So they, I think that happened frequently. They were sold yeah. off because that was always in the wife's face to mm -hmm. these children. Um, and when they were half the planter, he had, uh, uh, from some narratives I've read before, they would be sold off to work in the house and have a, a little bit easier life in some neighboring plantation or somewhere, and they would be maybe supported a little bit by uh, the, the father, so because it's actually part of his blood, but out of the wife's sphere of... Uh, he didn't have to see him. 
So that dynamic, I think, went, went on a lot in uh, plantation life. So um, I know in the Jewish tradition, if um, a Jew marries outside of that and marries, um, you know, a, a, a Christian, that the bloodline is that for the children is that they're Jewish. So would the same um, th type of thing happen if, if, you know, the slave has the children from the slave owner with the bloodline, they're still slaves. They're not, they don't become, so I think it has to do more with the bloodline and not necessarily, I, I don't know, I could be wrong. In, in the South, there was a rule, uh, you could be one sixty second or something like that black and you were still considered black. I mean, there was, there were extreme rules on that um, and they really adhered to it from what I understand. Well, and think about the logistics of proving paternity back then. The mother, it's, you can tell who the mother is, the father, it's not so cut and dry. It was easy because if you had kinky hair, what did that tell you? But make a mistake, it could be a Jewish father with kinky hair. I grew up hearing the expression, the N-word in the woodpile, if you had um, any kind of physical characteristic that was hard to cope with, but it was real and it goes way back. This has been very interesting. Thank you. Thank you too, Ellen. I agree. This has been a really fascinating conversation. Denise, you want to? promo the next one? Sure, I've already got it queued up in the chat. <laughs> we do have our next one coming up and that's the Brown Girl Dreaming. It's a um, autobiography in verse and this woman has won all kinds of prizes, National Book Award, um, the um, Newbery Award. It's kind of a YA crossover book which means it, it's written for uh, two audiences and at once, uh, young adults as well as adults. Um, we do not have access to a free um, digital copy as we did for this one, but we do have access to a couple um, ebooks. And we don't have the guide up for that yet. That will come next week. But it'll be a similar kind of reading guide, Cliff Notes, expanded resources. So we hope that you will join us for that one. Put it on your calendar. Who's the author of that one? Jacqueline Woodson. I just put it in the chat. I already read it. It's wonderful. Oh, cool. Okay. Oh, good. I'm going to enjoy it, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and just as a summary, she is, um, she is uh, maybe in her mid 50s now. And this is her um, take on growing up in North Carolina in the 60s and 70s. So as she's growing up, um, segregation is still very much in place and she's witnessing some of the uh, major civil rights events that are happening uh, so she kind of that's kind of a backbone of her poetry okay well what do you think Lori shall we send everyone off I think so thank you everybody Hope to Thank see you, you again next month. Thanks so Thank much. you for leading it, Laurie. Oh, of course. Yes. Thank you. Great job. Okay. We appreciate you guys all coming out. Take care. Thank you. Be well. Be you well. Too. Bye. Bye-bye. <clears throat>